And uh, I'm here with Mark Roberts and uh, we're going to ask him some questions. And you might know already that Mark is an avid surfer and as well as a yoga practitioner. And so my first question was going to be, if Mark, you're on your way to your daily practice and you're driving past the sea <laughs> and you suddenly see a really good break, what would win? Would you, would you veer off and park up and run into the sea or would you carry on into your Mysore practice? I'm presuming now, we'll say you're not teaching, so you don't have yeah. that commitment to your students. Yeah, uh, probably I would have already sussed out uh, what the wind and the waves and the tides were doing. The night before. So yeah, that wouldn't happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to make that dramatic yeah. choice on the time. Yeah, okay. exactly. But you do, I think what is nice is that you do keep up another sport as well, because we see a lot of people when they start yoga, they start giving up everything else that they do, either because their teacher has said to them, ah, oh, don't run because it's going to tighten up your hamstrings and your psoas or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you maintain your surfing and, and what does that mean to you and, and why do you keep it up and what, were your, um, what would you say to other people that have other things that they like doing? So for me surfing is something I love doing, it makes yeah. me very very happy um, and I try to live as much as I can by the ocean and my aim in my life is to be able to surf every day if I can. Nice. So for me, the yoga is something that complements my surfing. But uh, what I usually say to people in, uh, I tr I'd never say to people don't run or don't uh, do you other forms of exercise. But I do say that as in general, like if you want to get good at something, you have to practice that thing. Yeah. So you get better at whatever you practice the most. So if you want to get good at Ashtanga Yoga, then you have to put your energy into that. So that may mean that you have less time for those other things like running, biking, surfing or whatever. And would you say that there's aspects of the surfing that actually complement the yoga? Because sometimes we say about the yoga not being, if we thought of it as the physical practice, purely as an exercise yeah. rather than in a broader concept. Yeah. We sometimes say it's not particularly balanced because there's more pushing than there is pulling or there yeah. is no pulling. Yeah. Um, so how would you say that surfing, does that enhance the practice in any way? Well, yeah, there is all that pulling movement. In the paddling. In the paddling. Nice. And for me, strengthening and stabilization is very important. Um, so, yeah, people think, oh, that paddling is going to make you tight. Yeah which it may, but if you're doing enough in your practice that's working on opening yeah. the shoulders and chest and back, yeah. then doing the opposite, which is strengthening and stabilizing, yeah. is actually makes it, your body more balanced. Because when we watch your practice, it, it's, it's very, it looks very, very light and airy, and not that you're not trying, but and obviously we're not saying that it's easy for you, but it looks like the concentration is there and that you're not forcing anything. Uh, is that true to the way you think you practice or do you have an intention in the way you practice? Yeah, I, I, I try to be, get that lightness from having more strength. Yeah. So I work a lot on my strength. Yeah. So the lightness comes. Um, and yeah, definitely I try to stay relaxed and calm and never force always working with the breath, be, you know, like if I notice that my breath is becoming erratic or whatever, then yeah. I, I try to relax and, you know, take a step back. So that you're aware all the time, whether you're, how much you're pushing or yeah. and using the breath as a yeah. meter. Yeah. And it doesn't really help you to <laughs> go in to that point where you're, you're not comfortable. Yeah. And so you say you work a lot on the strength, so how do you do that? Do you work outside the practice on your strength? We said, okay, the surfing is, is what yeah. am I doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm doggy paddling. <laughs> the surfing is helping. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the surfing is helping. You can see I'm not a surfer. Yeah. The surfing is helping, but do you do other yeah. stuff inside the, the shala for your strength? Do you work in a particular way? Um, yeah, so during my practice, yeah. I'm, you know, every, every lift up, 
every jump forward, every jump right. back is, you know, it's like strengthening. done with full yeah. awareness and I try my hardest. Yeah. Every jump back, every jump through. Um, recently I've started doing some more extra uh, uh, training in that regard. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's out, and what sort of stuff is that? Is this so kind just of like, or? Uh, yeah, like, like body weight stuff, lifting L sits, yeah, cross legs, lifting, yeah, all that kind of stuff. And then that brings more lightness and more sensitivity as you not sort of working so hard during the asanas. Yeah, well, because you know during the practice, it's you know you've got two hours to maintain yeah. a high level of intensity. Yeah. Whereas if you do something for ten minutes outside of the practice you can give everything yes. for 10 minutes and really isolate whatever it is that you're trying to strengthen yeah and then when you come back to your practice you find that that strength is there you can translate it yeah. across and uh, how do you so say do you have themed days when you practice do you say okay today i'm going to work on all my jumps and lifts and today i'm going to work on just mula band and forget everything else or do you practice in a, a different way yeah I do, do I do that generally it's it might be you know if I've just taken a workshop yeah with a teacher then whatever the the main points were I'll be yeah. working on that for some time trying to integrate it into my body and that's maybe what you would suggest for people as well that have attended workshops of yours or other people's yeah definitely work with those few aspects and try and get them ingrained create yeah. new patterns maybe yeah yeah, exactly. And so if you've taken, if we can take your mind back then, some of the workshops that you've attended as a student, are there key things that stood out that you then integrated into your own practice and thought, wow, that made a difference? Can yes. you think of some specific <laughs> things? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, Richard Freeman yeah. has been a big influence yeah. uh, in terms of the movement of the scapula. Right. Uh, there's that the protraction of the scapula yeah. with the elevation of the scapula and a slight I guess you'd call it a posterior tilt even though you don't usually think of the scapula as moving in that direction yeah because it can actually change relative to the body yeah, yeah exactly so that that movement okay and regards to what so regards when you take your arms over your head for example yeah and uh, so then that's also there in the downward facing dog yeah it's there in your back bends it's there in Pajvakanasana. and we quite often talk about now serratus anterior as being that stabilizer of the scapula and a key component to the lifts and the jumps and that sort of stuff sure, i mean he, that's his it's, thing that's his too. thing yeah. yeah and so we often say oh you need to strengthen your serratus anterior yeah. But then it sort of often stops there, doesn't it? As to, okay, now, how do we strengthen serratus anterior? Yeah. So it's a, I mean, that muscle is not something you can really even feel. It's yeah. not like your bicep where you know, okay, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm flexing yeah, yeah. my bicep. It's like yeah. the, the serratus anterior, it's like, where is it? Yeah, yeah. You know, so all I know is like what it does. Yeah. So if I do say like that movement yeah. where I, I'm protracting the shoulder blades, then yeah. I know, okay, that's the... That's the the serratus is doing that. Yeah, and so which is, which would be the sort of preparations or w that you feel it in most? Is it that prep for jumping back from the sun salutations that you can engage into the, the serratus most yeah, noticeably? Yeah, I mean, the, for me, it's the one that I usually get people to do is yeah. uh, the angry cat. Right. So, what does it, can we see an angry cat? <laughs> <laughs> the angry cat. You know the angry cat. This one. Oh yeah, okay, yes, yeah. and so then the, the scapula are protracting and yeah. you're really making them protract even yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. And then you would hold that for how long? Well, half usually an just half an hour. <laughs> so then get that, keep that movement into like a high plank. Yeah. Like a high chatwari position. Yeah. And then try and keep it as you lower down yeah. into chaturanga. Because there's quite yeah. a few people that they have what we might refer to as winging scapula. Yeah. And, and we say, okay, yeah, serratus anterior is weak, rhomboids are properly weak. And yeah. you can get them to stabilize in that high plank. Yeah. But quite often when they start to lower, 
it all starts to go wrong again, yeah. doesn't it? So yeah. how do you work from that top part to getting person to learn the new patterns of keeping that in place as they lower Probably down? Probably then try a forearm chaturanga. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just holding it in that position? Yeah. And with the really same scapula the, position? Yeah, exactly. Nice. Yeah. And, and so we, we've got the serratus from Richard Freeman and any other... <laughs> well, not just Richard. <laughs> <laughs> from other people too, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, are there any other things that really pop out into your mind as to that have made a big difference in your practice? We try to drag out as much juice from you as possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if I look at his alignment principles of yeah. always having... A prime reaction and a counter action. Right. For me, when I heard that, it made so much sense and it really put a lot of pieces in the puzzle together. So can you give us an example of that? So like so if we go back to that, the serratus yeah. idea. So I, one of my first teachers who I learned most of my anatomy has applied to Hatha Yoga yeah. is uh, Simon Borg. Olivia. Oliver, yeah. So he's really big on that movement. Right. So I was, I had that already ingrained, but then I've also had Iyengar teachers yeah. who are very much into this movement and really big into pulling the shoulder blades, retracting the shoulder blades, yeah. almost pinching them together. Yeah. And then when that whole Anusara movement came out, it was all about opening yeah. to grace, <laughs> right? <laughs> this thing. So there was, a, I found there was a, like in the yoga world in general, there was a movement away from this pattern. This right. was seen as bad right. because of, it's closing your heart. Yeah. And so everyone wanted to be doing this, yeah. opening the heart. Yeah. And I was like, well, you're probably losing a lot of st uh, strength and stability, and stability, even though it feels good. Yeah. And yes, that's what you want to have, in, particularly in backbending and so yeah. on. So, or in say trikonasana, for example, yeah, you know, like that whole idea of keeping the hip square to the side, yeah, which is really the counteraction, whereas the primary action is to get the rotation of the external rotation of the the leading leg, yeah, and then you apply the counter rotation once you get into the posture. So that working on two things at once. And yeah, so also you, you, need to, you need to apply the primary action and yeah. then apply the counter action. Okay. So okay. for like the, this kind of action of the, the serratus, yeah. then you have to apply the counter action yeah. of lifting up yeah. through the collarbones. Yeah. So it doesn't so go too, not, too much. Yeah, exactly. Extreme. So you're not too extreme yeah. that way. Yeah. So you also have the balance nice. there. Nice. And so also, if they, you say you're doing the backbending pattern, yeah. then you apply the counter rotation or the counter movement, right. which would be to add in the abdominal yeah. contraction. And then that gives it maybe a little protection to yeah. the lumbar area. Exactly. So. Yeah, nice. So extrapolating that on a little bit, if yeah. you... It's a nice word, isn't it? Extrapolating. <laughs> yeah, I don't even if know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody knows what that means. Um, so we've heard some influences that you've taken from outside and then obviously you incorporate that into your own teaching and yeah. are there certain cues that you've given to your students that you feel have made dramatic differences to their their practices you know is there certain little things that you've seen them time and time again people doing this that and the other and you've said oh, okay this seems to work really well no <laughs> <laughs> i like the are you the angry cat i think angry is cat, something like. that it, it kind of it's simple people yeah. can visualize it yeah and uh that seems to, to be the one so that one say like so press up between the shoulder blades yeah that seems to help with those transitions you know out of uh bujipidasana into bakasana yeah and then jumping back yeah so all that same sort of thing yeah so that I mean, there's probably many more. And um, with, with Bujapadasana, as you mentioned it, Bujapadasana into Bakasana, yeah. it seems to be that the tighter you get your legs around, yeah. the, the snugger it is, but then the harder it is to get through. And then sometimes when you come back out of it, yeah. it's, it's, you can be in a position that is like very hard to actually open up into Titibasana to then do the transition sure. out. 
I mean, what I always find is that you have to keep the arms on top of the shoulders. As high as possible. Oh, sorry, not the arms, the, the legs. Yeah. On top of the shoulders there. As soon as they slide down onto the elbows, then, then it's you all over. It. So yeah, you have to keep them here, tuck under. Yeah. And then as you come up, see as a lot of people when they come up, the legs slide down. Slide down and then they and can't then they transition lose all out. The lift. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got to keep them up here to so keep the lift. So and then that makes it easy to get back in. To get back out. So what is the action that's going through your head that's going to keep those legs up on your shoulders? Angry cat. Angry cat. <laughs> so you're thinking angry all the time an angry cat. So yeah. you're going to be pressing the tailbone <laughs> forward. Yeah. And uh, pressing up between the shoulder blades and pulling the shoulders towards the hips. Yeah. Can we see that? <laughs> right here? <laughs> yeah, right here, right now. There's a song like that, isn't there? Yeah. I think. You don't uh, have to sing it. It's while you're doing it. Could be a bit tricky on this soft ground that I think. Would you want to get rid of that mat? Doesn't go too much mad. Do we need to see you from the front or the side? So this is fine, I think. So short, uh, legs up on top of the shoulders. Yeah, as we're going into yeah. it. And so then as you sit down, tailbone tucks under. So there your hands are literally directly behind your heels. Yeah. Yeah. Tailbone tucks under, press up between the shoulder blades and pull the shoulders towards the hips. Yeah. And then you squeeze in. I mean, I know you're supposed to jump into it. But yeah, we'll yeah. forgive you that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so squeeze the legs in. So this is a bit a lot of people have trouble with, isn't it? The transition yeah. through. Yeah. Yeah. So for beginners, I just say, just take it easy. Touch your feet and touch your head. Yeah. You know, and then the next stage would be to then just take the feet through there, still touching and then yeah. touch the head. And then the last stage is to keep the feet lifted yeah. and it's a lot tricky because then you have to let your elbows go back behind your hands. Yeah. And then you're just hovering, just hovering off the floor. I touch my chin. You touch your chin yeah. down. But what percentage of weight? So I won't keep you there. And then the yeah, next bit, hard on you can the ground here. <laughs> so coming up out of it, yeah. most people fall backwards. Yes. Because they're not pushing forward enough. Okay. So you have to push your hips forward. Forward, forward, yeah. Press up between the shoulder blades. Yeah. And pull the shoulders towards the hips. Hips. And then keep all that happening. So yeah. tailbone forward. Yeah. Spread the shoulder blades, shoulders to hips. As you take the legs, legs back. back to Bakasana. Yeah. And again, tailbone under. And press. here we can really get a good view of your back and the protracted scapula there. Yeah. yeah. Press up between the shoulder blades and pull the shoulders towards the hips. Yeah. And then nice. press and jump back. back and down. Good. We almost pulled the cold <laughs> camera and everything off of, <laughs> off of sight. <laughs> with, with my enthusiasm, yeah. I'll try and curtail your, your demonstrations. <laughs> but that was great because we could really see you broadening across the back and that, that curve, that increase in the kyphotic curve. Yeah. Um, so that was like uh, excellent. I'm yeah. dreaming of more demonstrations <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> so, great. um, is there, so when you're practicing yourself, okay, now you've reached, you, are you like almost through fourth? How much of fourth have you got I'm left? Almost halfway. Halfway through yeah. fourth. So now the postures are like pretty crazy, aren't they? They're like all sorts of things going yeah. on. So what yeah. do you see the challenges coming up? Is it a strength thing or is it even more range of motion around different joints? What, or is it a psychological thing? Yeah, there's, I mean, I haven't even... Fourth series is one of those series where you don't even really look. You don't to look see ahead. What's coming. Okay. Because a lot <laughs> of people you know, do, don't they? They jump ahead. I yeah. want to do the, the, the. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whereas fourth series, you kind of, it's always, like for me anyway, it was right. always like, it's so far down the track that okay. I'm not really looking at to s memorize or see what's coming. Okay. But I know there are a few postures coming that are going to be very challenging. For me, the main thing that's going to be for me is the ankle flexibility. Okay. Yeah. In what range? You know, like these. Is that the one where the foot comes right yeah, around? Yeah, you're only that yeah. or whatever it is, where one foot's coming like that. And yeah, it looks particularly nasty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so those sorts of things are coming. Yeah. And I mean, we know you're very strong already because we see that in your practice. Yeah. But do you think there's still a demand on your strength now? I remember you telling me just off camera at the moment that with fourth series, to, to main, it's a struggle just to maintain the postures that you're doing yeah. because it's hard to keep practicing fourth on a regular regular basis. Can you expand on that? 
Or I'm telling the story, otherwise I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's like every series where, as you're learning it, the postures yeah. are not that comfortable. And so with the fourth series, like, there's a lot of postures there that I need to be really in the best condition. Yeah. Uh, and have also, uh, like, the room needs to be hot. Right. I need to be sweating. I need, yeah, all those things to get into, a, it's a, like two positions in particular. Right. To get into them, I need that extra sort of heat. And uh, because I'm traveling a lot, yeah. often I don't have that, uh, so I'm not like at my peak. Yeah. So to maintain that level is difficult. And, and do you have a period in the year when you say, because with all that traveling, yeah. and you still, you have to, you know, you have what, your own uh, desires as far as what you want to do with your practice and, and yeah. so do you have a chunk of time during the year when you say okay this is for me and I'm going to go back to Mysore I'm going to do yeah. this so or that? that's what I'm doing every year okay. two months in Mysore yeah so after here I'll go there yeah and yeah that's the time where I feel like I can really just put 110 percent into into my practice and when you get back there does Sharath go what have you been doing you you've got <laughs> weak or, or no, whatever not yet not yet not yet so and no I mean I I've I kind of like have always in my mind that I'm preparing for yeah. that in a sense yeah like I'm I'm in the moment practicing obviously during the year but yeah. in a sense I'm like I'll be practicing at that intensity for two months yeah one of the biggest mistakes I've made in the past and I see people make regularly yeah. is they have an experience in Mysore, which is amazing and their, their practice goes to the next level. Yeah. But it's because often, I mean, it's because you're supported by the group energy and by Sharat's presence yeah. or Guruji's presence in the past. So it's bringing out something in you. Yeah. But w then when you leave there, you can't maintain that and this creates uh, you know if you don't let that go yeah you end up you know like kind of suffering and striving and too striving much to ca think, get I, it back I, I could do it there why can't yeah. I do it now? yeah, oh, it's, yeah. why is it so hard now yeah because you know it's five o'clock in the morning yeah. you're back in the city you're practicing alone and it's the middle yeah. of winter whatever yeah and so for me now it's like I don't try and maintain that I could just do what I can. And then have a full power And then I just, there. you know, like slowly I'm like building myself up so that I'll be ready for myself. And are there any big challenges that you've faced in your own journey within the practice, even on the, the more broader scale of, of yoga and the, the different limbs? Are you, is, there, is there, you know, certain parts that you've struggled with more than others? <laughs> like for example for example a big topic. <laughs> yeah I mean you know it, it looks like the the physical practice that asana is not easy for you because obviously you worked very hard but is it then has it ever been more difficult for you to meditate or to do the pranayama or are you equally engaged with those sorts of things as well I my focus has definitely been more towards the asana right but I've also maintained a meditation pranayama practice yeah on and off for the last 15 years or so yeah so it's there like the base of that is always there it sometimes it kind of goes you know sometimes I don't sit and do the pranayama sometimes I just do the the asana practice yeah but uh, you know like at the moment I'm doing sitting pranayama before I do my before you practice, practice yeah and do you think that makes a difference as to whether you do it before or after? Because sometimes I think with like myself that once you've hot and warm and open yeah. then and you've got rid of some of that that physical energy, yeah. then I, I feel I'm A, more comfortable sitting yeah. to do it afterwards and B, maybe more willing to let go because I'm not thinking of the yeah, practice. Sure. But I, it also fits quite nicely before, doesn't it? Yeah, I know a lot of people prefer like and that it makes sense particularly if you have had a good practice and then you've stilled the mind yeah you've awakened the breath and you know open the body up yeah and then you can sit but I find that um, 
usually by the end of my practice, I'm just ready to get on with my day. Yeah, get on the beach and surf. Yeah. Or is that happen? Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. I mean, what's yeah. what happens when when because quite often the best waves are in the morning, aren't they? Yeah. And also we tend to practice in the morning yeah. too, don't we? So what happens in those situations? I've learned to be able to practice any time. Any time of day? So okay. I can, if the surf's good in the morning, yeah. then I'll, I'll go surf. Yeah. Or if I have to teach in the morning, yeah. I don't always practice before. Sometimes I practice after. Yeah. So, you know, I've learned how to practice Anytime. So you're pretty versatile. On a full stomach or whatever. <laughs> on a full stomach, Not yeah. on a full stomach, but <laughs> I can practice in the afternoon. Yeah. Even, even if I've had lunch, I can still practice. Yeah. In the afternoon, I've, you know, like I've kind of, particularly with the travel and then also yeah. with the surfing, I've just let go of having to be like, have all those things right. Yeah, everything in yeah. place. Yeah. And so how would you spread out the the sequences that you do. So we're saying it's difficult to maintain a fourth series like so yeah. many days. Do you, do you mix it up or do you do a primary one day and a how, yeah, how's so it go? like this week what I'm doing is I started with intermediate. Yeah. Uh, then I did third the next day. Yeah. And then um, I did so a bit of I then I did the second half of third. Yeah. The last two days I've done the second half of third and the part of fourth that I'm doing. Okay, so you, so you mix so I just it split my practice. And then you and still then finish the week then, with a yeah, primary? tomorrow I'll do primary. And tomorrow you'll do primary. Yeah. And for those people, there's, you know, there's a whole swathe of people that are stuck at Capitasana. You know, they do all the primary and the first chunk of second and then yeah. donk Capitasana. And, yeah. and, and, and that can be quite a long practice, can't it? Yeah. So would you advise repeating that day in day out apart from Friday or would there be a more yeah, sort of no, beneficial I mean, way to do it? I think the practice has to fit into your life. So yeah. If you have family, if you have work commitments, so on, then you need to modify things. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're working on that first part of second, but you haven't got the time to do all of the primary yeah, as well, would there be a good place to split? I mean, even Shad is doing that now, splitting okay. and doing like half primary one day and then you do the second half. So you do first half primary and then oh, go so, into the second. So like up to Kumasana, so? Yeah. Okay. And then the next day you start there and go through. Okay, so how much of the seated, so you do your standing, so say yeah. it's the second day, you yeah. do your standing posture, you yeah. jump through as if you were going to do Pashimottanasana. On, yeah. on I think you I seem to do, remember. Do you do Pashimottanasana. You do yeah. do Pashimottanasana. Okay. And then, I'm not sure you could do that because it might, and Purvottanasana, and then go into like Pujipirasana. Yeah. Kumasana. Yeah. So you d you go from there and then yeah. still do that first part of second. Yeah. 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 And yeah, it's important for people to, you know, like. To manage their to time. Manage is the time exactly. It's a massive drag, uh, yeah. not a drag because we like doing it, but a massive <laughs> yeah. drain on your hours it's of free yeah, time, it isn't is. it? It is, it is, yeah. And the fact that, uh, the fact that Kapitasana is such a sticking point, are there things that you found that people can work with outside of the practice maybe even, or, or openers and stuff like that, that helps gain that strength stability uh, for, that, for that posture? Yeah, I think all the, anything that's opening the front of the body, so all yeah. anything that's doing hip flexors, yeah. quads, and you know, the, the shoulders, yeah. all that needs to be there. And do you, do you, do you, do you, do you that was, yeah. Do you <laughs> Politically correct. Yeah. yeah. Do you, do you um, do that sort of thing yourself? Do you do openers outside of the practice or do you do, I know we, you work on the strength stuff, but do yeah. you do any other opening things outside of the practice or do you just do it all in the practice? I have what I call my everyday essentials. Okay, yeah. which are toothbrush and toothpaste. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, like for example, when I wake up in the morning, yeah. then I like to, I keep a journal. So the yeah. first thing I do is I squat yeah. and then I write like that, drink my coffee. So I'll be like 20 minutes, 25 so minutes. So you're staying in the steep squatting. squat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and just in general, whenever I sit down to get something, I try to avoid 
just picking things up like that. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to get better at squatting. No. Nice. Because I never could squat. You know, when I first came to India, I yeah. was, you know, up like this. So tightness in so the Achilles? Yeah, or? yeah, tightness in the Achilles, is yeah. especially. And so this movement is really, you know, fundamental to the practice and for everyday life. You need to be able to do this for your hips and spine and everything to be working on. I, I was watching the ladies that are doing the gardening because I start my day similar, not for yeah. 20 minutes, but, but yeah. as a little pre-warm up to the practice. And I always do a squat. And I was watching the ladies um, doing the gardening here and picking up the leaves and things like yeah. that. And they, they stay in that squat. And, but they'll also, they'll move yeah, within that move. squat yeah, yeah. to do stuff. Yeah. And so I've started that same idea of, of yeah. actually rolling and moving in the squat. And actually it really helps to open up the hips, it does. you know, so it it's does. like, it's quite I mean, cool. This is Bhuji Pidasana, yeah. basically. It's the same thing. Yeah. So Kumasana, it's there. Yeah. Marichasana. Yeah. You know, all those movements come from here. So that's, you know, like when people are struggling with those postures. Yeah. And it's no wonder. Yeah. If you can't, if you're not doing this movement in your daily living, then those postures are going to be difficult. So maybe the easiest thing is rip out the Western toilet <laughs> yeah, exactly. and put in a squat toilet <laughs> exactly. and you're sorted. <laughs> Particularly if it takes you a little bit long to pass your stuff. Exactly. You can be there with your newspaper instead exactly. of in your hip flexed position of, of normality. Yeah. Exactly. Two birds with one stone. Yeah. So there's and then, you know, like yeah. the, just all the hip opening movements that you see children doing. Like yeah. when you see a baby yeah. on the ground. So Parakanasana. Yeah. So I try to incorporate all this into my daily life. So instead of sitting in a chair, yeah. sit on the floor like this. So you write your you like write this. your journal in yeah. the squat. Yeah. What do you do? I might in even your go into this position in this in while writing. Yeah. You know, while you're writing and these yeah. and these this, and these. This. And breakfast. Yes. <laughs> put behind head for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> we should make <laughs> a two sitting in a squat for the interview. For the whole interview, yeah. yeah. I yeah. think I like, uh, you might have to carry me off <laughs> later and hang me from a tree to sort of straighten me out, I think. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's like a little morning regime. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, I often say similar to people, you know, if you're watching telly uh, in the evening or whatever, yeah. then sit in one of these positions because it does sure. the same sort of thing it you know like you if we're in a we're doing our yoga practice holding some yeah. po postures for five breaths yeah and we do that for an hour or so a day yeah if most, some people are not even doing that um that's not enough to counteract you know eight hours like of this what we're doing at here. the computer or yeah. standing with bad posture or whatever so yeah you, if you can start to incorporate these movements into your everyday lifestyle, then that's where big changes can It's going to break some of those patterns as well, isn't yeah. it, that we've, we're generating? Yeah, I mean, we all, the examples used so much, you know, like for Indian people who, yeah. or Asian cultures that are used to sitting on the ground, then all these movements of half lotus. Second nature. Yeah, okay. it's, yeah. there's no problem for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with your own practice, because we often see that discrepancy between those movements that you said, which is like external rotation of the hip, yeah. and then Trianga Mukha, Kapada, Kroon Chesna, it's that sort of medial rotation of the hip. Yeah. Uh, before you started the practice, were you more open one way or the other? And has that changed over time? Or is there still that discrepancy? I think, <coughs> to be honest, it was fairly, fairly, ba fairly balanced. Yeah, I didn't have, like, I've, I could always pretty much do Supta Virasana right. when I started. Yeah. Um, yeah. And do you think that came, because that is like very tricky for a lot of people, again, probably because yeah. for the same reasons of, of the patterns that we generate. Was yeah. there something in the lead up to your life that you did you used to sit like that as a child no, you know, or anything like that? I mean, so just, yeah. just, just the way you are. Yeah, I was never that tied in the quads, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> Quite yeah. handy. Yeah. And so say somebody has the, a certain discrepancy. Yeah. So say they are challenged with medial rotation or they have a discrepancy between one side of their body and the other. How have you found that it's best for them to work with that? Is it, do you get them to hold certain sides longer or repeat yeah, certain things or be, be a good way that to sort do of it. thing? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
use a prop if needed yeah. on, on the more difficult side. Yeah. I might not adjust them on the side they can already do and then adjust them on the difficult side. Yeah. That kind of thing. So just working a little bit, rather than getting into that idea that it has to be five breaths all the time when it has to be... Oh yeah, yes. I mean, that yeah. you can definitely m <laughs> yeah. break out of that. You know, if you need to stay sometimes 20 breaths yeah. <coughs> longer if you need to. And how do you yourself generate that because when you're on a five <coughs> breath thing and the, like here we're in Goa, the weather is lovely and warm anyway, so yeah. there's no problem generating that heat. Yeah. And you said you also for your the fourth series, you need that heat. So if you're like traveling and you visit one of the colder countries and, and, and you're still practicing, how, what do you do in your practice to make sure you're generating as much heat as possible? Do you change your breath at all or, do you, or how do you work? I would probably work more on uh, muscle activation. Okay. Yeah. So work more on being as <coughs> active as you can in the postures yeah. and maintaining the same breath that you would use all yeah. the time. Yeah. Mm, nice. Good. Um, yeah. So if um, you're doing workshops all around the world with, with um, in different places uh, and, but no matter where we are in the world, there's often the same sorts of challenges that we have in our practice quite often people want to know about the jump throughs and the jump backs and and uh, lifting into handstands and things like that um, what are the things that you find uh, keep cropping up and, and and the sort of advice that you give to people in these workshops that you're uh, doing uh, this what I talked about earlier this shoulder stabilization yeah that's a big one I don't know if that's only because I'm focusing a lot on, on that in my own and practice. And they pick up on that. And then I see it in other people's yeah. practice. Um, so like headstands, for example. Yeah. I don't like to see people, you know, taking so much weight on their head and not having that proper stability through yeah. their arms. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, it's debatable how much weight you should take on your head. Yeah. But I think you should have the option of uh, being able to lift up if you can. And what is your personal view about how much weight on the head? I say like 70% in the arms, 30% in, the, 30 arms. Okay. in the head. Okay. And, and if somebody wants to work on that lifting the head off the floor, yeah. what is a nice sort of stepwise way to do that? Or is it take them to the wall first as they, they know they're safe or...? Uh, I think practicing Pincha Mayurasana is... Practicing Pincha? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's really the same action. Yeah. It's in, in the hand position, slightly different. But it's that same action of like really getting that um, rotation through the forearms. Yeah. Really pressing through. Uh, so you're getting, what is that, the pronation. Yeah, it's yeah. pronation of the yeah. forearm. Yeah. Yeah. And so really pressing in the headstand will be through the wrist and the elbow. Yeah. But in the forearm balance will be through the thumb and first two fingers yeah. and the elbow. Yeah. And then getting that uh, in pincher, also getting that the protraction. Yeah. But with also uh, the depression, yeah. pulling the shoulders towards the hips. And there's a little exercise there, isn't there, as well, when you can sort of bring the head forwards and down towards the hands and then pushing back up again. Do you oh, do that sort of thing? That, yeah, they call the dolphin or something. Is it that yeah. sort of thing? Yeah, it's yeah, pretty, definitely that. It's really also, hard, isn't it? Yeah, and the forearm chaturanga also yeah. I get people to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, so really just making sure that that strength and that understanding of the way the scapula should be moving yeah. is there. And handstands must always be a, a big favorite, isn't oh, it? Yeah. As far as yeah. trying to figure out what the hell to do, because yeah. quite a lot of people can, they can throw themselves up and, yeah. and catch it and, yeah. and sort of hold it for a few seconds before the tree falls. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but perhaps can you give us like uh, an overview from the ground up as to what we should be thinking about when we're setting up for a handstand, what we're doing with our hands and going up through the body? Yeah, so hands, you want to focus on thumb, first to fingers particularly. Okay. Um, also, you can use your fingertips as a, you know, because you're in so much extension in the handstand that uh, 
you want to also activate your flexors a little bit. So you're creating, sometimes they took a, like about a hand bander here, you're creating a little suction cup or yeah, not as I, much I as that? I don't think so much like okay. that. I try actually to really press to that press. bit really down. Yeah but still activating the fingers f even before you go up or is the balancing when you're up yeah, there? Yeah, more when I get up there. When you're up there? Just use the fingertips a little bit. Okay. Um, what I would say now is that you need to be able to lock your elbow, which okay. is, you know, I know it's, people say it's a bad thing to do to be locking your elbows, but in those arm balances, if I when I watch the good arm balances, yeah, they definitely lock their elbows. And what about for those people that hyperextend their elbow? I guess you'd have to take it on a case by case basis. Basis, yeah. if that's causing them problems, and you then might don't bring a micro bend into it. Okay. Yeah. Um, the shoulders uh, are actually elevated. Okay. Which kind of goes against everything that we try to teach people in yoga is to pull your shoulders away from the ears. Yeah. But actually in the handstand, you have to elevate and your shoulder blades. And are you you're actively encouraging that or resisting it with this counter balance of drawing back down or are you Not actually really encouraging the elevation? You, you've got to try and push the floor away okay. to make your feet go as high as possible. Yeah. So really that ends up being like full elevation of yeah. the scapula. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So again, are you thinking of reversing the actions that you did on the way up to come down or are you thinking of different things on the way down? Yeah, re reverse. I mean, every, activating everything that I use to come up. So yeah. really shoulders, that protraction, yeah. the abdominal muscles, yeah. all that's got to be there. And the, and the same on the yeah. way. And then as you come to, there's a point where you're coming down yeah. and then you've got to close it off but still keep that distance from the feet from the floor to then lower the feet down if you want to start roughly where you began yeah what's happening in that little section there where it comes from here now are you again taking your shoulders way in front to recreate yeah, yeah. where you were yeah. at the beginning so the shoulders have to come forward right abdominal muscles switch on hip flexors yeah yeah and all the time when you're in the setup, you're looking, where are you looking in relation to your fingertips? So if my hands are there, I'll be looking... Sort of here. roughly in line with the, the tops of yeah, the fingers? Maybe some, yeah. Slightly in front. Yeah. And then when you're up, do you maintain that same gaze or are you shifting your gaze? I know we, you could take your head yeah, through. Yeah, keep the gaze same spot, but if you want to get the straight, then you take the head under. Take the head under, and then your gaze goes anywhere specific or just to the wall? Yeah, just to the floor or to the wall. To the, f yeah, to to the, the ground or to the... Okay, yeah. okay. And then with the feet? We yeah. see differences there sometimes. Yeah. Is that Iyengar do with, the, with the, the ankle flexed? He does with, uh, with plantar flexion and uh, spreading the toes. Right. So that kind of... That sort of... That thing. Nice. Can yeah. you see that in this camera? No. My, <laughs> my toes don't do that. I think I'm a mutant. Or are you the mutant? One yeah. or the other. <laughs> they just no, sit so there. So plantar flexion and, and eversion yeah. is what that is. Yeah, so... But in the shtanga we point the feet. Yeah. And if you look at dancers, yeah. handstand, the arm balances and everything, they also, also point, point the feet. Yeah. I mean, I've tried it with the, the ankle um, dorsiflex, yeah. which is this position, yeah. but it, it doesn't give you that same sense of, sense of going, reaching no, it and, doesn't, does it? Yeah. It's a little bit curtailed with that at yeah. the heel. Well, that, particularly if you dorsiflex, if you do yeah. that, well, like the Iyengar thing of yeah. the pointing and spreading the toes, yeah. what that can do is that it kind of, it's like, it brings your awareness yeah. right out into your toe tips and it really activates the leg yeah. and you start to get that kind of internal spiral and then after that point the feet. And a lot of people lose that connection with their inner thighs don't they? They get oh, up yeah. all right and then they begin to be sort of one leg is doing this. Oh, yeah, so totally. what, what's happening with the legs? Are we? Uh, so you would say I would say that the hips 
this is a thing about the rotate counter rotation and counter rotational yeah. primary and secondary action. Okay. So the primary action would be to get the internal rotation of the thighs. Yeah. So that you get that line coming out through the inner ankle. Okay. And the big toe. Yeah. But then once you're there and you point the foot, you want to actually use your glutes to help yeah. stabilize, which yeah. will bring the legs into a more of an external rotation. Right. So it's that. So never overdoing one action for the sake of another. Yeah. And that external rotation will also help you bring the tailbone up. And, and get Because the problem most people have in a handstand or any inversion is that their back arches. Yes. So they go into a back bend. And we see that a lot in people that may be very good at Urba Danyarasana yeah, and Kapitasana. And, yeah. yeah. But then they have difficulty stabilizing. Yeah. So how do you work with those people to create that core stability? Because they maybe got the flexibility to get up there and the arm strength, but yeah. then they've got a noodle center. Yeah. yeah. So all the stuff that I've been mentioning, like the forearm, yeah. chaturanga, uh, you getting that angry cat yeah. position all that stabilization through the shoulders. All of that's gonna... You know, and it, it's all connected. This front ribs drawing in, tailbone dropping, getting the legs working. So you create the connectivity between yeah. the top and the bottom. And it's got to be there through the whole practice, you know, like yeah. if you're doing Paschimottanasana, then if your feet are like this, yes, then how are you going to go upside down and yeah. have that awareness of what your legs are doing. Yeah. So in all your sitting postures, in all your standing postures, that action of that footwork has to be there. Yeah, because quite often, as you say, as soon as a foot is out of eyesight, yeah. it does all sorts of so things, doesn't it? It goes upside down and then it's yeah. just dangling in the air. Yeah. So you have to train it from the beginning. And do you think it's a good idea of, of training it with the, the holding of the foot and the, the physically pulling it out to get yeah. it flat? Or do you think we should be focusing on getting those muscular patterns to be able to hold it in yeah, that the, position? The using the hand is just, just for show. Yeah. It doesn't actually train anything because when, you, then you, let when go. you let go and the foot goes like that again. Yeah. So it has to come in the standing sequence. Yeah. So all your standing postures. You know, okay, so when you, you come into trikonasana or whatever, it's yeah. always getting that action pressing through the base of the big toe. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for and those so, people, a lot of people do, do like either this. rolling onto the yeah. outside. Yeah. yeah. That's the most common one. Or even collapsing like sometimes onto oh, the yeah, inside. Collapsing like this, yeah. Yeah, great. So, thank you, Mark, for being with us. And we can see the nice, we've got, we deliberately picked this spot because it's got water behind us. So we knew that you'd feel nice and comfy uh, with your Hopefully potential water. <laughs> but great, thanks for sharing. And there's like such a ton of useful information in that interview. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jim. Cheers, Mark. Yeah. Take care, man. Thanks a lot. Cheers.